Good evening. I'm Bradley Graham, co-owner of Politics and Pros, along with my wife, Lissa. And on behalf of the entire staff, I'd like to welcome you here. Uh, it's always very encouraging for Lissa and me, since assuming ownership of the store last summer, to look out over the store at events like this and see so many people. It's a testament not only to the value that you all place on these author talks, but to the role that independent bookstores like Politics and Prose play in providing a forum for public discussion of literature and ideas. <laughs> if, 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 if you don't clap, you'll stay a lot cooler. <laughs> um, I'm sorry about the heat. I mean, we turned down the air conditioning hours ago. But, um, anyway, Liz and I are committed to keeping politics and prose alive and to maintaining these forums free and open to the public. What that means, though, is that occasionally, you'll have to put up with a, a little overcrowding. <laughs> it, 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 this, is, this is a lot of overcrowding. Uh, still, we don't think it has to be quite this crowded. And we've been putting a lot of thought into how to renovate a bit and free up some space for more seating. We think we found a solution and hope to restructure the main floor sometime this summer. So please stay tuned and please be patient when the renovations are underway. We're doing a number of other exciting things to grow the business. Many of you may already have had a chance to see and even use the book printing machine that's in the, the fiction room. Uh, it can access out of print books or produce self-published works in about five minutes while you watch. We've added dozens of new literary classes and we just announced a new program of literary trips. The first two will be in October, one to Ireland, the other to France. You can check out the itineraries and sign up at politicsandprostravel.com or ask about the trips at our information desk in the center of the store. And for more details about our books and programs, please consult our main website at politics-prose.com where you can order books for delivery and also download ebooks. And now for this evening's featured attraction. Uh, it's particularly exciting for me to be introducing Paul Krugman. He and I happen to be in the same class at Yale. You can see what I was up against. We didn't actually know one another then. I spent much of my time reporting for and editing the campus newspaper, and Paul was immersed in economics. Hmm. <laughs> if I only had studied economics harder, we should also probably do a study of how many of us ended up with beards. Uh, Paul's academic achievements alone add up to an impressive contribution to humanity. His work in international trade and finance led to a Nobel Prize in 2008, and he taught at Yale, MIT, and Stanford before landing at, at Princeton as professor of economics and international affairs. But Paul has also had an impact well beyond academia because of his great ability to write about economic ideas and developments for non-economists. He's authored or edited more than 20 books, and he's been a prolific writer of columns and articles, including currently a New York Times column that appears twice a week. Paul's new book, End This Depression Now, addresses our current disastrous economic situation. In blunt, lively, at times witty, and always engaging prose, Paul describes what should be done to fix the economy and end the suffering. As he notes in the introduction, much has already been written about how we got into this mess. The question he focuses on is, what do we do now? Any regular reader of Paul's New York Times column will not be surprised by his arguments. He thinks the government should be spending more with a renewed focus on job creation until the private sector is better able to carry the economy forward again. That's not what's happening, of course. Instead, austerity policies have become the rule. Paul writes that, quote, a combination of self-interest and distorted ideology has gotten in the way, preventing us from solving a solvable problem. We're in tonight for a provocative economics lesson from a real master. Paul plans to speak for 20 or 30 minutes, and then he'll take questions. If you have a question and can manage to get up to one of the two <laughs> microphones at the front, uh, we appreciate it because we do record these events and then and post the recordings online. And afterwards, Paul will remain to sign copies of his book. And judging from the size of the crowd, he may be here until very, very late. Um, anyway, please silence your cell phones if you haven't already. And join me in welcoming Paul Cooper.
uh, I actually was debating whether I should try to be respectable and and uh, and wear a, uh, wear my jacket and uh, decided not, which turns out to have been a really good idea. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if I looked a little disheveled, it, well, it's been. Uh, it's, it's, I've been working rather hard uh, trying to sell this book. Um, <laughs> let me just say what, how, how grateful I am to Politics and Prose, both for hosting this and for, for existing. Uh, the, there's nothing, you know, nothing like a bookstore, uh, especially in the country. Um, the other, you know, there's, we live in this age of electronic stuff, and I use it to where you can generally find what it is you're, you were looking for, but only in a place like this can you find what you weren't looking for, which turns out to be what's really important. Okay, so um, uh, why, why this book? Um, so I, I, of course, I, I write columns. Uh, I have a blog, which uh, has kind of taken over more of my life than I ever expected it to. Um, I've been arguing, and, and many of the arguments that are in the book are also have, have, have been there before, though I hope I've added some, some new stuff. Um, but I've had the sense of trying to argue what we do uh, in, this, in this situation. Um, that the, there is a there is a need for a, 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 put, putting the whole argument in one place. That uh, I often feel like I'm I'm playing whack-a-mole uh, in, in the argument. I'll, I'll I'll advance an argument and somebody will raise an objection which I had actually already answered in a, in a in a previous column or in a previous blog post. But of course, people don't necessarily remember that, and it 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 really is helpful to put it in one place. Uh, this is different. There have been tons of books, some of them really wonderful, about how we got into this mess. Um, some uh, there's now we're getting a series of, of sort of postmortems on on policy in the first two years of the Obama administration, which is also a worthwhile enterprise. But somehow it's not. That's not the. That's the issue now. Is is okay? Now what? What do we do now? Um, and let me say in particular that that an awful lot of the how did this happen um, is kind of it's almost a prurient interest. Everyone wants to talk about the excesses of the boom and the bubble. Everyone wants to talk about the, the reckless lending, which is fine. But you know. Um, Bad lending, bad investments are one thing. Mass unemployment is actually a much more serious question. And, and one does not necessarily follow from the other. There's this tendency to, to view the whole thing as a morality play, where well, you sin and therefore you must suffer. But first of all, that's wrong on the economics. And secondly, the people who are suffering are not the people who sinned. Uh, right? And so let, let me just start by, by saying a word about what, what I think everybody knows, but it's just worth emphasizing, which is how terrible things remain. You know, we say we have a recovery, and uh, it, 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 there actually, there's been some genuine improvement the last few months. Uh, but still, my God. Um, so we just had a report out this morning, actually, on very long-term unemployment, people who've been out of work for more than a year. And it's 3.9 million people now. So it's down from four. Uh, wow. Um, there's been nothing like this that since the 1930s. And you want to think about just, just what it does to be out of work for that long. Um, even if you don't have a financial squeeze, it can destroy your, your, your soul. I, I know people in that position, but of course, for most people in that position, it's a, it, it means losing your house, it means losing everything. It's a, it's a life-destroying thing. Um, and it's also a disaster for, for the future of the economy. People who've been out of work for a long time tend never to get employed again. Um, there's also, and I wrote about this actually in, in, in Monday's paper, uh, the, the problem of the young. Uh, this is an incredibly catastrophic job market into which to graduate, whether, it, whether you're a high school graduate, but even in fact, very much so if you're a college graduate. There's been nothing this bad for recent college graduates again since, since the 1930s. And it's a, uh, um, you can see it, the unemployment rate among recent graduates is actually higher than the national average unemployment rate. So if you hear something about how well it's okay if you have a lot of education, not if you're young. Um, the uh, lots of, a vast number working part-time, and a clearly, you can see from the, the wage numbers, an awful lot of students who've studied hard, gotten good grades, gotten their degree, run up a lot of debt, and are now working as baristas or whatever, just can't find a job that makes any use of their skills. So it's, it, and that's a disaster. And we actually have a, we have a fair bit of evidence on what that does. You know, how long will it take someone who graduated into a lousy job market to make up for that, to make up for the bad start to their working, to his or her working life? And the answer is forever. They never will. Uh, people, e students who are born into a bad job market in 1982, who, who graduated into a bad job market in 1982, never made up for that. And this is, of course, far worse, far worse, far more sustained than anything. So en enormous damage is going on right now. And the thing about it is that this is not, 
this does not have to be happening. Uh, we have not had a plague of locusts. Uh, we have not had a tsunami in this country. We have not had uh, uh, harvest failure. Uh, we haven't lost the technology we had. Our workforce has not lost its skills. Uh, this is all a preventable catastrophe. Lots of people have trouble with that. They, they think that if things are this bad, there must be deep reasons for it. There must be something. There can't be easy answers to it. So that my, one of my favorite quotes in all of economics comes from John Maynard Keynes, who's an uh, inspiration for all this. And he was writing, he had, a, he had a, a, an article he wrote um, called the, the, uh, uh, the Great Slump of 1930, uh, written, of course, in 1930 just as the Great Depression was getting going, which reads amazingly, just a few words. And it's, it's a description of what we've been going through now. Um, and, uh, and he said, we have magneto trouble. It was an old fashioned, but it basically meant trouble with the electrical system of the car. And his point was that you can have a, seem, a fairly trivial problem, which can nonetheless cause a car not to run at all, uh, and could be fixed pretty easily. And so think of it, you, you can have a $30,000 car, which won't, won't run at all because you've got a dead battery. Uh, and you tend to think, well, if we've got a $30,000 car and it won't run at all, that must be a major problem that can't be fixed qu quickly, but actually you might be able to buy a $100 battery and get it moving again. Um, that's the situation we're in. Um, now, it's a tremendous task, it turns out, politically and intellectually to get people to accept that, to, uh, to get to people to accept that actually there, there are easy answers. You know, everyone is just very wisely, there are no easy answers. In this case, there actually are easy answers. This is actually, this is really, this would be really easy. People won't believe it, and that makes it politically very difficult. And I have a little analogy saying if you've got a car that, uh, a $30,000 car that won't run uh, because it's got a dead battery, but your husband refuses to accept it, it's just a dead battery, and insists, insists that you have to take buses and walk instead, uh, you do have a problem, but the problem is not with the car. Uh, <laughs> that is, that's basically, um, that's basically where we are right now. Um, it's been an incredible, and, and this, is, this is not, I guess it's important to say that I'm not doing some kind of outlandish, radical economics. This has been this weird thing where the crazy, uh, um, you know, radical, uh, uh, bearded college professors uh, saying we're doing it all wrong, people like me or like Joe Stiglitz, uh, are, uh, are actually talking standard textbook economics. Um, and uh, stuff that we knew. In fact, I have a, something I've been thinking about. And if, if we'd had this crisis, um, the current crisis in 1971, which was the year that, Rick, that Richard Nixon said, uh, I am now a, a Keynesian on economics. Um, we would probably have dealt with it very well. We would have had uh, reasonable policies. We would have had bipartisan agreement that we needed to save the economy. Unfortunately, we don't have bipartisan agreement on anything now, because uh, if, if Barack Obama wanted to honor the nation's mothers, he'd be uh, barely attacked for that. Uh, <laughs> but, and, and we don't have, but, but, but above all, what we have is a lot of unnecessary, you know, um, spuriously generated um, intellectual confusion. You see that all the time. Um, and uh, uh, if there was, if anybody saw ABC uh, this week on Sunday, uh, uh, there was a panel of experts, so was, uh, supposedly to discuss the economy. Um, what I actually said on, on as, as I walked off the set, was actually taped on Friday, was uh, we're doomed. Um, <laughs> because it was, um, it was, it, was like, it was like the punchline for a joke, right? Car Carly Fiorina says what we need to do is co co corporate taxes. Uh, David Walker says we need to deal with the entitlements problem. Uh, um, Eric Schmidt says we need more high-skilled people for Google. Um, all of which is, all the, you know, I don't agree about the corporate tax thing, but these, these are things we can talk about, but they're not actually what's going on. Uh, what's going on is that we have um, not enough spending. Uh, the private sector uh, overreached. During the uh, during the bubble years, households and and before we had a long period of complacency. People ran up more debt than they should have, um, and then an abrupt uh, actually what what some of us like to call a wily coyote moment. Um, after you know you run off the cliff and only when you look down. Um, but people said, oh, that's too much debt, and so a lot of people are being obliged to pay down debt, which means that you have a situation in which people who are in debt are being forced to spend less. And people who are not in debt have no real re reason to spend more. So there's a shortfall in spending. And that's what produces a, a recession. Or, or Actually, I use the word depression in the title. I do that advisedly. Um, recession is when things are going down. Uh, depression is when things are down. 
and for an extended period. The Great Depression, roughly speaking, 1929 to 1940, it was not all shrinking. It was actually, there were two, re two recessions and two recoveries over that period. But throughout the whole period, the economy was deeply depressed. It's not as deeply depressed right now. That's one hell of a slogan, right? Not as bad as the Great Depression. Um, um, but it's pretty bad. Actually, for, I'm, I'm going to be a little, you know, scatterbrained and nonlinear here. Um, we actually attempts to, we, don't, we didn't have the same unemployment statistics then as we do now, but we can try to retrofit. Uh, um, and best estimates are that in 1937, uh, which was the year that FDR unfortunately listened to the, uh, the serious people of his own time and slashed the WPA, uh, sending the economy into another downturn. But in 1937, by modern concepts, the unemployment rate was about 9%. So actually, we are, we are, in fact, not significantly better than we were in, in 1937. So we are really experiencing depression conditions. Um, the right thing to do in that situation is for, if the private sector has gotten itself to a situation where it, it can't be induced to spend enough, and that is the situation, then temporarily, not forever, but temporarily, the public sector needs to take up the slack. This is a time for the government to be spending more, not less. What's actually happened is this especially since, uh, since 2010, is we've gone totally in the wrong direction. Under the onslaught of bad ideas um, and, and interest group politics, but, but a lot of just plain getting it wrong, uh, we've actually done the reverse. Instead of spending more, government has spent less. We've had, so another thing that people aren't quite aware of, I think, it, just look at, at since, since Barack Obama took office, private sector employment is about back to where it was. On, on, on inauguration day. Public sector employment is way down. It's, uh, and, and that has never happened before, at least not, uh, I think, certainly not, not since World War II. Uh, normally, um, public sector employment, which is mostly at the state and local level, grows with population, uh, which makes sense because if you want to think who are public sector employees, um, almost half are teachers, basically. Think teachers, firemen, uh, policemen, but above all, school teachers. And uh, the, uh, if we, if we followed the usual track, we would have added around 700,000 jobs in the public sector. Instead, we've cut 600,000. So where that's a unique and it's a tremendous drag on the economy. Uh, we've cut back on investment projects, cut back even on basic maintenance. Uh, I don't know about here, but in New Jersey, the roads are full of potholes. And uh, um, all of which is exactly the wrong thing to be doing and has made all the difference between what might by now have felt like a uh, a real recovery underway and the, the actual disaster uh, that we're experiencing. Lots of amazing, so we, we have an economic analysis. We, 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 people have thought about, worked on, studied uh, these issues for a long time. Um, we have a pretty good idea of how this thing works. But a lot of influential people decided to throw all that out the window and go with stuff that, that appealed to their prejudices instead. Uh, this extraordinary belief that somehow or other actually slashing spending, austerity, in the face of a, of a depressed economy was going to make things better. And why was that going to happen? Well, confidence. It was going to inspire confidence. So my, my contribution to the English language is I, uh, I introduced the, the notion of the confidence theory, uh, the belief that, which is widespread among serious people, that you could do stuff that clearly is going to make the economy shrink, but somehow it's going to grow because the confidence theory will come in and make it all right. Um, so we don't get to do experiments, controlled experiments in economics very much. I think it would be a violation of the human uh, uh, research guidelines actually to do it. Uh, but we've done what amounts to a, a, as good an experiment as you're ever going to get uh, within Europe, where because of the way that things are set up and a whole bunch of, of special problems that they've created for themselves, uh, they've had extreme austerity in some countries, but not in all. And the, the results are in. Uh, it's been disastrous. It's been disastrous even in the countries that, that were good soldiers and did everything they were supposed to. Think about the Irish, who have been mm. totally uh, kind of this sullen acquiescence, but they've done everything they were supposed to in terms of, of austerity, and have been told this will bring back confidence, have even had their recovery supposedly hailed not once but twice in 2010 and 2011. Again, people saying, oh, you see, Ireland's on the re road to recovery, and it isn't. Uh, unemployment is 15%. Uh, the economy has shrunk by double digits. Uh, incredible disaster. And um, so if you have a, you know, we had a test of two views of the world. Back in the beginning of 2010, I suppose it was possible 
to argue that people like me or Jeff Stiglitz or uh, or Christy Romer, the, the former head of the Council of Economic Advisors, had the wrong model of how the world works, and that so people like uh, like Paul Ryan in, in, uh, the, in, in the House or, or Jean-Claude Trichet at, at the European Central Bank had the right model. But over that period, those guys have been wrong about everything. Um, and people like me have been right about most things. Not everything, but, but, uh, but good enough you know, to say that we, we have a pretty clear test. So what do we do now? Um, economically, it's actually, as I said, it's easy. In fact, it's a lot easier than it was um, three years ago. So three years ago, when we were a little over three years ago, when, when the, the, uh, the Obama administration was moving into its new digs, um, there was a lot of, uh, some of us, so there's a legend, which is that people like me said the, the stimulus would work. If you actually were reading what I was writing at the time, I was tearing my hair out, saying this is way too small. This is, this is going to dis discredit the idea without delivering any, any of the real benefits. Um, but there were some legitimate questions. If we should be doing a lot of public spending, could we do it in fast enough to provide the necessary relief? Uh, could we, uh, uh, were there enough shovel-ready projects? Um, and I, I think actually we could have done a lot. We certainly could have done a lot more than we did. Um, but this certainly was a, a, a little bit hard. If you, a lot of the things you'd like to do, uh, um, major infrastructure projects, do take a long time to get going. Um, now we don't even have to find that to make an enormous difference, because all we have to do is reverse the totally ill-advised spending cuts that have taken place. All we have to do is have the federal government provide enough aid to the states and the local governments so that they can rehire those school teachers and resume those road repairs. And right there, you can get more than a million people employed, quite short order. Uh, um, I do a little, a little math in the book. It's quite clear that you could get the unemployment rate below 7% in quite short order. I mean, this, th this thing could be, the, the nightmare could be ended faster than anyone imagines. Uh, anyone serious, anyone who hasn't actually done the, done the analysis imagines. Um, politically, it's obviously hard. And you have to con confront uh, um, both uh, scorched earth opposition to, uh, to anything that, that, uh, that, that the president might propose. Um, and a lot of bad ideas that re retain their currency in spite of having been wrong over and over again. Um, but you try to make headway on that. You don't, you don't say, that there was a really bad instinct, I think, uh, on the part of the administration, which was that if there was stuff that they didn't think they could get or it could get anytime soon, that they should not even ask for it. That they should basically just go quiet on, go quiet on what really should be happened, happening. And that, didn't, that turns out to have been not at all a good measure. Um, and when they started, finally, last fall, actually getting a little bit more aggressive about saying these guys are standing in the way of what America needs, it turned out to be a political winner as well as, as the right thing to do. So you keep on pushing. Um, it is a huge task. Uh, we got to turn this thing around is going to be really hard um, politically, as in economically. If, 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 we could, if we could somehow have a conversion experience and get uh, all of these obstructionists to, to understand what is really just basic textbook stuff, um, this thing would be over in 18 months. Um, and uh, um, it's not going to take longer than that because it's not so easy. But this is why we write books. And so I have this new book trying to start the process of getting us moving in the right direction. Thank you. Because <laughs> this is going to be. Uh, uh, that's an old cartoon. Daddy, are we live or on tape? Anyway, you are, you are both live and on tape right now, so, so we need you. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, great. I was at the uh, Economic Policy Institute this afternoon. Oh, you're yeah, double dipping. Okay. Double dipping, and I enjoyed it just as much the second time as the first. But anyway, um, I was anxious for you to launch into a critique of present mon monetary policy, but you really didn't. So yeah. now I'm going to ask you, right. could you launch into a critique of President Monetary Policy? Okay, so, um, so one thing you should know is that the current mess did not come as a total shock to economists, at least to some economists. Um, there were people, we, we kind of had a dress rehearsal for what we're in, um, in Japan, 
which, which entered a, a similar kind of prolonged depression in the 1990s that has never really emerged. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of economists just didn't pay attention or figured there was something wrong with the Japanese. But a few people looked at it and said, you know, that's the underlying, you know, they're, when you get past the superficial things, uh, they're a lot, they're not that different from us. Rich country, smart, uh, uh, smart populace, uh, a stable government, uh, lots of, uh, you know, lots of freedom of maneuver, um, policy officials who may not be ideal but are not idiots. Uh, if they can get caught in this trap, it could happen to us. Um, and there were people trying, so it sort of saw this as a potential. This, this, this could, we could be next. There was actually a little knot of, of Japan warriors at uh, Princeton University uh, when I went, uh, came there in 2000, which included um, myself. People who were not household names, were uh, big guns in the field, Mike Woodford, Lars Svensson, um, and a fellow by the name of Ben Bernanke. Um, and at the time, Ben Bernanke was a harsh in his criticisms of the Bank of Japan, which is the counterpart of the Federal Reserve, for not pulling out all the stops, for not doing a whole bunch of stuff. Then he went to the Fed uh, and ended up as chairman. And I thought did a very good job of management in the heat of the crisis, uh, but then slacked off. And so what can they do? That a large part of the reason that this is hard is that the normal thing that the Fed does is, in the face of a recession is it cuts short-term interest rates. The Fed basically can, it's always dangerous to get to, but the Fed, the Fed is in a, um, can, can basically add or subtract reserves from banks very easily, and the banks lend that money out or not, and, it, and that affects interest rates at the really short end. And that gives them, in normal times, enormous power to move the economy. But it has a limit, which can be summarized in one word, which is zero. Uh, you can't get, and those short-term rates are zero. They can't go any lower. So the conventional response, the, the aspirin you normally take for, for when the economy has a headache, isn't going to work at this point. But there's a bunch of other stuff they could do, uh, a bunch of other stuff that was laid out in detail by none other than Ben Bernanke uh, a dozen years ago. And they hadn't been willing to do more than a small piece of that other stuff, which I think um, it's some combination, as I say, it's some combination of bullies on the board. It's uh, it's a combination of being intimidated by right-wing people who are constantly accusing them of, of you know, it, it's, it's, we're going to be Zimbabwe tomorrow. Uh, and uh, even though it, that's one of those predictions that has been wrong again and again and again, and yet somehow opinions don't move. Um, and the other is the institutional defense. It's a lot more comfortable for the Fed to say, well, we've done all we can, sorry, uh, than, than to do something that might not work but might and is really, really necessary. So that's been my critique. Uh, the things they have to do are... Stuff that, that is not conventional, um, probably the most important thing would be to say that we, we are going to seek to have, over the next five years, we're going to seek to have inflation that's higher than our usual rate. That we're going to uh, try for 3 or 4% inflation over the next five years, um, which would both discourage people from sitting on cash uh, uh, right now and would also um, uh, erode the overhang of debt, make the, the real value of that overhang of debt that's holding the economy down get less. That, that could probably do quite a lot. Um, it's a proposal that may sound radical, but it's been endorsed by, I don't know, the chief economist of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, it was endorsed by Professor Ben Bernanke back in 2000 for Japan. Um, so that's uh, the, uh, so the board, I'm sorry, I didn't explain that. The, uh, uh, we said that we, that, that Ben Bernanke has been assimilated by the Borg, yeah. as in Star Trek, that he, he's become a Fed person, uh, defending the institutional interests of the Fed, and, and, and Professor Bernanke would have scoffed at that position. I think that's, that is a fair thing to say. It's, uh, um, so I don't expect, or I wouldn't count on the Fed being able to solve this problem by itself. It would be a lot, I, I would still think that the prime solution would be rehire those school teachers. Uh, but the Fed could do, be doing a lot more, and particularly since the Fed can act, does not require that you get past, uh, past the crazies in the house, um, that, that the Fed uh, should be playing a much better, bigger role than it is. So I'm, I, I suspect that uh, Ben Bernanke won't be very friendly to me the next time uh, we meet, but I'm actually doing this for his own good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. How are you? Okay, good. Um, I, it's, nice, it's nice to meet you. I, I know nothing about economics, except when I think of you, you're not to put pressure on you, 
but you're like a prophet because you comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> yes, well, that was uh, kind of it. But my, my question is, and I, this isn't really something I think that you can actually answer, but maybe you can speak to. Yeah. Um, and I've been teaching school for 36 years. I teach at a private school. And so I'm not one of those public school teachers that need to be rehired. My three, uh, um, 403B goes up, and I feel just as great, but oh gosh, the bad guys are winning again. Yeah. Um, and so what I'm curious about, a young colleague asked me one time, how can I reconcile teaching at a private school yet asking these questions of my students, we read books to ask hard questions, and I told him, well, you just gotta make peace with biting the hand that feeds you. Yeah. And so one of my questions is, I don't know how hard to tell him it's okay to bite. <laughs> oh, look, um, there, there's a, look, I think there's a way to put, we have had, there's been some kind of corruption of the notion of what it means to be authentic in our society. People will say something like, um, uh, well, Elizabeth Warren, who's one of my personal heroes in, in, in Massachusetts. Right? Uh, people will say, Elizabeth Warren is calling for higher tax rates on the rich and more aid to the poor, but she and her husband are actually very affluent, so clearly she's insincere. And I'm like, what? She's actually calling for policies that would hurt her financially because she thinks it's the right thing to do. And that's, that's, that's I think, the way to, to think about this. Now, I'm not a socialist. I don't believe that, that you know, making money is a bad thing. I don't. I don't hate the rich. I just want them to pay more taxes. And uh, and I'm doing well enough myself that that pretty much everything I'm advocating would actually hurt me financially. That's that's not that's not being inauthentic. That's 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 just being uh, that's actually just being a good citizen. Um, and there's no no inconsistency. There's nothing wrong with there being private schools. Uh, I think uh, I do worry that we've starved the public schools of resources so that. A lot of people who could and should be sending their, their kids to private school, to, to public school, um, are, are abandoning the system, which is a bad thing for everybody. Uh, but that's not, we're not going to ban private schools. If, if you want to do that, that's fine. But it's, it's a, uh, uh, so, so the answer is, you don't have to, don't have to, to, uh, to, to, to join the revolution uh, if you think that, the, that a lot of rotten stuff is going on. You just have to work against it within, you know, we are still a democracy, uh, if we can keep it, and, uh, and, and, and do what you can as a citizen. Thank you. Okay. If by the end of the year, the euro breaks down, two parts, a northern yeah. European euro and a southern European euro, what would the impact be on the U.S. and global economy? All right. And, uh, wow. Uh, also, uh, if one of the larger European banks should fail, which American banks would be affected? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so let me, um, here's, here's what I, I, I can say. I actually don't think that the two euros thing is, is a, a realistic scenario. I think if, if it breaks, it, it breaks up into national currencies. Um, um, I, I would say that the odds are quite strong that Greece exits. And then the question is, how, how many other dominoes fall when that happens? And um, now that is not, in the long run, that's not such a terrible thing. Um, because you know, Europe used to have a bunch of separate national currencies, and it wasn't, and it, it worked. You know, people who say that you can't have economies that closely linked um, with their own currencies, uh, tend to forget about, uh, I don't know which my directions are, but you know, there's a place called Canada um, that does fine with its own currency. Uh, even though if you actually look at where, at the part that's actually populated, Canada is closer to the United States than it is to itself. Um, <laughs> but, um, but the transition is really ugly. Uh, among other things, because of sheer confusion. If, if, uh, if Spain, Spain is, is actually the, the uh, the, the pressure point. Uh, if Spain uh, leaves voluntarily or more, more likely is forced out of the euro, what, uh, a, a claim on a Spanish uh, debtor, Spanish bank, is that, is that a claim in euros or is it a claim in new pesetas? And, and, and that's going to be a legal morass. Uh, a lot of financial disruption. And actually the most important thing, this is something where I've spent enough time in Europe and, and, and am sympathetic enough to them to understand that it's a disaster politically. The, the European project the project of political integration in tandem with economic integration 
It is one of the best things that's happened to the world these past 60 years. It's taken a war-torn continent with a terrible history and turned it into a place of peace and democracy. And all of that's in danger now. And a failure of the euro is going to be do enormous damage to that. Now, the impact on us. Um, there's two kinds of impact. One is, is the European economy takes a beating, uh, which would in the short run, though not all that long. And that hurts our exports, which is real but limited. Uh, in spite of all of the globalization, we export less than 2% of what we produce in this country to Europe. It's just not that much exposure. Banks. The banks, you could, you know, you worry about you know, super Lehman. Uh, you worry about this uh, co co exploding lack of confidence. I guess I'm 80% relaxed about that because I believe that, that uh, governments and central banks will step in to bail out the banks, as they have in the past. That, in fact, they will, this will be contained, and that we'll have less of a panic because people will expect it to be contained. Now, there is a question. What if, uh, what if we do, you know, what if, if the euro breaks apart in, in, uh, in February uh, 2013 and President Obama says, okay, we need to step in to contain the financial damage, and, uh, and the, uh, the Republican majority in Congress says, uh, Oh, if it's coming from President Obama, we're against it, uh, and 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 their their uh, and their Wall Street campaign contrib contributors don't have enough s enough pull to, to tell them, you know, you really, you really don't want to destroy the world. So that's that's the twenty percent that I have. Uh, but um, but I think this this is all. But I actually think the European problem is primarily a European problem. But that's no reason to be relaxed about it. This is you know, Europe is our is the same size economically as we are. Um, in terms of the fate of the world, it's every bit as important as we are. And, and ugly stuff is happening in Europe, even if they don't have this catastrophic scenario, this ugly stuff. Uh, um, my, the, um, I've been using, allowing my, my colleague, Kim, Kim Lane Shepley, who has the Law and Public Affairs Program at Princeton, uh, to post some stuff on, on my blog about what's going on in Hungary, where you really are seeing, in the heart of Europe, a clear march away from democracy. And this wouldn't be happening if it weren't for the economic distress. Yeah. So this is this is this is really bad stuff. Uh, the effect on U.S. GDP is really a second-order consideration. It's the effect on my God. Our, our, you know, the, there are photos. You can see photos of, of some of the. Uh, there are paramilitaries in Central Europe again. Look at those photos, and you find yourself wondering what. Wait, what? What decade? What century are we in? It's really there. There are ghosts of the past that, that I never expected to see again in my lifetime. But there they are. I yeah. to ask a follow-up question about Greece. Uh, I'm sorry, I just can't no. Oh, well, this was, you can't, oh. Um. Well, all right. I, we have. We seem to have a majority vote. No. So, can we come back? Maybe we can do it in a bit. But there's a long line of people at can each I, phone. At each. Uh, another question. Here. No, 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 no. I think we're going. I think we have to ration. I'm sorry. It's. Uh, we're going to have to have death panels on questions. <laughs> Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that. One is, you're going to send your book to Obama. Two is, why did he listen to Geithner and Summers and all the rest of them instead of you? And three, what can he do now, given the Republican horrible right. opposition? So, <laughs> no, so there, there's, there's limited, let me answer that, the last one first. There's limited stuff he can do, but, but he can do two things. He has, there are areas where he still has leverage. There are things he can he can do. There's things uh, that um, you know a lot of mortgages in this country are owned by Fannie and Freddie, which are government agencies, and they can do a lot of refinancing without congressional uh, authorization. Um, and they've been very slow. They, the, the the head of uh, the federal housing agency is dragging his feet, but he can be replaced. And um, and this is you know Obama is the president, and he can do more there. Um, the um, um, the uh, um, I don't need to send the boat. I'm, I'm ta I talk to people in the administration. Okay, this we're, 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 it's, it's been actually been very strange after all those Bush years when when um, the, you know the, the only question was whether they were tapping my phone. Now, 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 uh, now they actually call me and invite me down for for meeting and stuff. So that's a very different story. Um, there was a there was a real question. The, the clout of, of Wall Street and people associated with Wall Street. So Geithner himself is, a, is squeaky clean. No, no hint of any financial or personal corruption ever. Uh, but he's, he's so was immersed in the Wall Street environment, intended to, to, to take it the side of Wall Street in a lot of disputes. Um, and Wall Street in general has this, it's not just that they have a lot of money and they can give, they can, 
you know, steer campaign contributions. And it's, it's not even just that there's a revolving door and people, uh, there's you know, an awful lot of people who were in public policy somehow end up at Citigroup after, uh, after their stint. Um, but it's also that they're impressive people one-on-one. -on -one. They're, uh, they're smart, they're often funny, they're clearly at the, the aura that comes with having made a great deal of money, they have uh, fantastic tailors, um, and they're, uh, <laughs> um, they tend to be very impressive. And so, uh, look, it, it is public knowledge uh, that there was a dinner fairly early on with, uh, with, with Obama and, and the whole economics team and a fair bit of the political team, and then a bunch of uh, progressive economists, Jeff Stiglitz, myself, Robert Reich, uh, um, uh, Jeff Sachs, uh, Alan Blinder, and um, and you could just see that that you know scruffy bearded college professors um, had a hard time making the case that they knew better than these uh, these much more polished seeming people. Of course, it turns out that that we did, but that was a um, but, I, but but I think they've learned that lesson. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay well, this is sort of in. In the same vein, um, starting with the proposition that President Obama is not a stupid man. Um, not at all. He's actually he's extremely. Uh, I mean, that's not that's if there's this weird myth on the side part of the Republicans, but but just try talking to him. He's he's he is every bit as smart as as, as rumor has it. And, and given the formidable opposition that he faces, um, be, let me say besides the formidable opposition that he faces, what do you think has prevented him from embracing? your ideas, or what appears to me, his lack of willingness to embrace your ideas. And uh, where do you see him okay. you know, in the political economic spectrum? Early on, I think he was persuaded by the people who, who understated the gravity of the whole thing. You know, there were some of us who were saying right from the beginning, this is the big one, you need to pull out all the stops. And, uh, and there were a fair number of people in the administration who treated as more of an ordinary an ordinary slump and if we can just sort of contain the panic things will set themselves back on the right course fairly quickly and, and uh, he was he listened too much to that side early on since then it's been a political question what is the right way to deal with this uh, with this Republican opposition and much longer than they should have they they labored under the illusion they being Obama and a lot of the people around him, under the illusion that if only they were sufficiently conciliatory they could, in fact, make a deal. And this, basically 2011 was wasted on attempts to actually make a deal with people who will never make a deal. And uh, so that was, and that's, that, there was some, you may remember, some of you, that I was pretty skeptical of Obama during the primary. Uh, largely because it seemed to me that he, he was approaching with this notion of post-partisan, being able to transcend the divide, it wasn't going to happen. Uh, actually, Barney Frank said that uh, during that period that, that Obama gave him postpartisan depression, and, uh, <laughs> and so that was that, that was a uh, that was an error, and it was an error that lasted a long time. But again, that's all behind us now. I mean, I I really think that we need to. I, I, I'm I'm tired of rehashing. You know what should what should what should he have done in 2009? When, and and and, and the, the the tone is very different now. I mean, obviously when I talk to White House uh, you know, officials, they're they're probably trying to spin me and tell me what they think I want to hear. But I think the real the tone has really changed. So I think they're they're you know much in a much worse position. I wish they'd been this tough back when they had more leverage. But I but but you know there's an election and it, the. You know, everybody's kind of assuming that it's going to go, uh, that, that Obama will squeak through, maybe, uh, but face a hostile Congress, but that's not at all certain. I mean, yeah. lots, I talk at the end of the book about different with scenarios, uh, and there, there are possibilities that he will uh, have more leverage. There are things he can do even if he doesn't. And there's also, you know, uh, um, we don't know what Mitt Romney uh, actually believes. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, actually, that, some people listen to say his campaign slogan should be, um, vote for Romney, he doesn't mean any of it. Um, and, uh, um, his economic team are not stupid, actually. Uh, but whether he would have had the ability or, or the, the uh, or, or, or the backbone to stand up to the to the the crazies and uh, who, who dominate his party is another question. But but all hope is not there. It's it's not as if everything hinges on on uh, and, and also it goes on, right? That's, I've been writing columns now for since 2000, and it's never over. There was, uh, in 2004, you know, people said, oh, this is the death of progressivism. There will never be a, 
make a comeback. And then in 2008, well, this is the death of the hard right. and it ne It's never over. You just keep on plugging. Hello, Professor Krugman. It's an honor to be here. I'm a sophomore at George Washington University here, and I've been addicted to your blog for the past years. I have to say, I took Macro 101 last semester, went to about half the classes, I got an A-plus, and that's thanks to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is, about a month ago on your blog, you linked to a, a paper basically making the claim that 70% was the best top marginal tax rate to make uh, marginal utility of the dollar. Yeah. And, and you added by saying, you know, if a hedge fund manager is taxed more, he works an hour less, he makes ten thousand dollars an hour. He's just reducing his economic activity is just reflected in his reduced income, and otherwise it would be an externality which a free market wouldn't yeah. allow. But today, in the Times, another article that you linked to uh, yeah. was that long article about Mitt Romney's best friend from Bain Capital, who was saying, "Look, I make only one dollar for every six dollars of economic activity that I make, and so I shouldn't be taxed more because my divine intellect and investment yes. is going to be harmed by a higher tax." I was floored by that. What do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, well, that was. I actually put up a blog post this morning. Uh, uh, rich guy says that we should be grateful for his wealth. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, but, and, and I think this is probably giving us some hint of what Romney really does actually right. believe. Uh, um, and think about it. This, this, uh, you know, it, they, the, the conservatives talk as if they believe in, in the, the idealized notions of, of perfectly competitive markets, and yet. When pushed on that, when taken this, this notion that we should actually have a quite high tax rate on, on top incomes because they don't get a lot of utility from the money, and, and uh, it, it's, 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 it takes a while, but it, the argument is, is actually ironclad that, that uh, from the point of view of everybody else, you should really have a quite high tax rate, which probably around 70 turns out to be the right number uh, um, for, for the top, for the highest incomes. Um, that confronted with that, they suddenly start to say, oh, but there's all these non-priced, non-market benefits which come from the labor of the wealthy, but oddly don't come from the labor of anybody else. <laughs> so, but this is, you know, this is ultimately, it is, that is, it, there's always a question, how do you deal, we like to talk about ideas, but at a, at a certain level, you know, it, the ideas are actually just being deployed in the service of interests. And, uh, and it, it's not really the case that, that, that the right wing of America is about um, promoting free markets. It's it's about promoting rich people, and uh, and free markets is an argument being used on that on that basis. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Reading your article in your your books and listening to you tonight, I thought about uh, Dr. John Snow, the man who ended the cholera epidemic in mid-century London by taking the pump handle off the pump. Yeah. And because it feels like what, what you're really emphasizing is this is science. And that, that the struggle, while it's both political, it also is science against, uh, should we call it non-science, or fantasy, or the, uh, uh, the theory yeah, so, that cholera is in the air? Yeah. So, no, there's, and there's, um, I, I, I actually, I bristle when people talk about economic science, because that's almost always used to convey the sense that we, we know more than we do. But, but there is evidence. There's a, you know, we, look, we know quite a lot. There, there are facts. There are, uh, uh, um, and we've, as we've had one hell of a test of, of, uh, of macroeconomic theories. Uh, we've, we've tested some theories pretty much literally to, destructive, to destruction in, in the last few years. Uh, so we know quite a lot. The trouble is, uh, uh, actually, there, there was, uh, so the, I shouldn't plug someone else's book, but the uh, uh, Thomas Mann and Norman Ornstein have a new book uh, called it's, it's Even Worse Than You Think, um, and which they said, so it, 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 this has been sort of obvious to a lot of us, but, but it's important that these guys who have a reputation for being almost pathologically moderate said it, that, that the problem with our political system is not some generalized hyper-partisanship, it is the Republicans. And they, they say that the, uh, and in the introduction they say that among other things, the modern Republican Party no longer shares the conventional attitudes towards facts, evidence, and, and, and science. Um, it just doesn't matter. Uh, they, and, and that's been very clear that in this, in this stuff, that, that how, there, there's an interesting question. I, I wonder a little bit about the role of tribalism. Uh, if you, this I always encounter. I, you, know, you see uh, when, when I look at uh, the comments that come in on the blog and my correspondence, the, the people who are, hate 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 me just not on on because I'm saying things that they really hate about economics. Who are often business types, often investors, and if if you had actually been investing based on 
um, what the Wall Street Journal editorial page has been telling you the last four years. You would have, you'd be broke, right? They've been wrong about everything. And yet there's something about the tribal affinity that makes this kind of stuff appeal to a lot of people. And uh, that I can't fight. I can just keep on plugging on the, fact, on the facts and evidence and hope that at least some people care about that. I wanted to ask you about this issue of inflation uh, target, a higher one. And uh, one of the issues is it undermines the credibility of the uh, Federal Reserve. That's one. The, and and uh, Ron Paul was saying it's, it's now. That's one question. My other question is, do you expect problems when uh, Ben Bernanke go, goes back to Princeton and you have meetings at the, at the faculty? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the, on the first one, um, which is what, what he was saying in, in response right, to this is Jim Deborah Nagy's yeah, statement. Yeah, yeah. But the question is, uh, credibility for what? I mean, uh, the, it is, well, the I mean, Fed is credible as, as a, as a some place that will always fight inflation, when sometimes that's not the right thing to do. That's actually not credibility that you want. Um, way back when, when I was, you know, I we hashed out many of these issues 15 years ago. When I was writing about Japan in 1998, <laughs> I said that actually what the Bank of Japan needed to do was to credibly promise to be irresponsible. It had to promise people that it was not going to slam on the book brakes as soon as, as soon as a bit of inflation reared its head. And that's, that's the situation right now. The, the, the Fed's credibility is actually damaging. It's, it's inflation fighting credibility is actually hurting us. If you're going to say it's, it's theft, uh, well, you know, there are lots of things that, that you do in economic policy that, that, um, that, um, that hurt some people and help others. That's, that's sort of everything you do is going to do that. And there's nothing on a federal debt contract. There's nothing on, on a treasury bond that says, and we will have no inflation. Uh, you, that was not a promise. So it, it's not theft if, if there isn't a law saying you can't do it, right? It's, it's just policy. And, and it may or may not be advisable. But in, in this case, if you ask the question, should I uh, be prepared to, to condemn uh, 3.9 million Americans to permanent unemployment and, and many others to long stretches of unemployment uh, because I because uh, to honor a promise we never made to bondholders that seems to me to be crazy um, it's gonna be interesting the relations with with Ben Bernanke uh, when he comes back uh, um, we've but I, I, I look forward to someday hearing the real story I guess I continue to hope that, that that he has a secret diary, which he explains that you know that locked in, locked in a, in, a, in a safe with with the armed guards that says actually I agree with with uh, uh, not, not just me but but all the former Mike Woodford who is who is not totally not a household name but is arguably our our leading macroeconomic theorist right now has been saying exactly the same things I've been saying so I I, I wonder if there's you know Paul and Mike are actually right but I can't say that I I, I imagine that that's written maybe in disappearing ink. <laughs> Do you think that, as well as increased tax rates for the rich, perhaps instituting carbon tax or legalizing substances, drugs, and prostitution, taxing that would help get us out of this economic depression? Well, really, well, right now, the problem is not. The deficit is not right now a problem. The deficit is actually, for the time being, helpful. It's, it's helping to support this economy, although we do eventually want to bring it down. Um, we should be taxing carbon. Um, it would be a revenue source for sure, uh, but that's not the main reason to tax it. The reason is, is that uh, if you ask what terrifies me, ultimately it's not economics at all, it's, 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 uh, it, it is the environment. They, well, just, uh, just to an interview, what, I was asking, what, what do I think is, uh, what worries me most about the, not the, the next few years, but, but the, the, you know, the next few decades, and it is climate change. I'm, yeah. just fr I'm terrified that, that, may, that in 10 years or so we'll realize that this thing is really spinning be out of control. It'll be undeniable. At that point, it could be too late. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason to, to do the carbon taxes. Um, my general sense on things like drugs uh, is that we're trying, you know, we, we do seem to have recreated all of the evils of the Prohibition era, and that doesn't sound smart. But I really haven't thought that stuff through carefully, and I haven't thought through the prostitution side at all. I've tried, <laughs> that's, uh, not my department. <laughs> of a turning point will uh, this Sunday be when uh, Hollande is elected president of France and the uh, Greek government falls in the elections. Oh, well, yeah. Well, it's going to be interesting. I mean, uh, first of all, we don't know that for sure, but I guess it does look like it. Uh, it's going to be interesting because Hollande is, he's, uh, it's all very vague. So, so in case you're not fine, right, we have a, we've had a, uh, a president of France who's been 
um, who's gone along with the whole austerity mania. In fact, people talk, you know, uh, celebrities speak. They talk about Mercosi uh, running, running Europe. Uh, and uh, there's also apparently a, word, a new word in German, which is Durchmelkung, which is to, to muddle through without solving your problems. Uh, <laughs> but um, the, um, but, but uh, and Hollande is, is at least verbally against uh, the austerity and, and talking about higher taxes on, on the top end, uh, but very vaguely. So, will he actually move? But, you know, things, it will certainly accelerate. There, there is a, it's becoming obvious to even, uh, to even a lot of people who've been, you know, keeping eyes firmly shut that, that this thing is not working, that the austerity um, situation is, is not, it, the austerity <laughs> solution is not an answer. But, um, how it, the European thing is really kind of irresistible force hitting an immovable object. Uh, on the one hand, you think it is inconsistent. First of all, this is not going to the, the current policy is not going to work. It's going to it, it's catastrophic in its impact on on the the peripheral economies, and and they can't go on like this. Um, it's so, and you on the one hand, it's inconceivable, given all that's at stake, that European leaders will will allow this thing to fail. And we have a pretty good idea of what might make, save it, but it require but what that requires is. Actually, what it requires above all, is what I've been saying that Ben Bernanke should be doing here is even more necessary there. The European Central Bank has to, has to accept that inflation needs to be higher uh, for, for quite some period of time. Um, it's inconceivable they won't do what's needed to solve the euro, but it's also inconceivable that the Germans would accept a higher inflation. And, uh, and so one of two impossible things is going to have to happen, and I don't know which one it is. Um, curious thing, actually, about the uses and abuses of history. Why is it? that everybody in Germany remembers the Weimar inflation and the terrible things that happened. And nobody remembers the hard gold standard deflationist policies of Chancellor Brüning uh, in the early 1930s, which is what actually led to you-know-what. So it's a kind of curious thing that they've, they've been very selective about which disasters to remember. Okay. Uh, thank you. When did we lose our common sense in the, uh, <laughs> in the 1980s? Uh, it seems, whether we liked it or not, we entered into a new social contract with a value proposition. And that proposition is um, we make an investment in the wealthy. And we, don't long, we no longer call them wealthy. George Bush wants us to call them job, seek, uh, job creators. Yeah. But um, you know, we made, as a nation, we made a large investment through taxes and everything else in the wealthy. Uh, and the value proposition was that they were going to create jobs. It's been 30 years, and we were supposed to get trickle-down prosperity. Yeah. All we've gotten is trickle-down misery. And how come nobody sees that? Um, you know, most people don't. People's memories are not that great. Uh, you, it, it, a lot of selective reporting. Um, the uh, um, a lot of money behind uh, convey, you know, re rewriting history. So it, it's always a. <laughs> A problem, and, and it's not. Unfortunately, it's not. It's not just the unwashed masses. Eh? And if you um, read my blog, every once in a while you run across this amazing thing where somebody, some actually famous economist, will say, "Well, you know, we never had really good growth in this country until Reagan cut taxes." And it's like post-war generation. Don't you have parents who can tell you about how they did? You know, um, but uh, so it, yeah, maybe it was always thus, but it is pretty extreme. And I don't. I don't think there was a moment. I think that uh, we we had. We, we just it just gradually eroded, but you get the process, uh, the, uh, the the political process that by which by which we, we lost our moorings is uh, is an extensive one. It goes back to a whole lot of stuff. It goes back to uh, to Richard Nixon and his Southern strategy. Uh, it goes back to the founding the founding of those right wing think tanks, which is mostly early 1970s. And uh, um, read Rick Perlstein, and you'll get how it all happened. Yeah. Uh, how do you account for the rise of this stock market in, in light of your pessimistic view of what's happening? The stock market supposedly is a predictor of how the economy, I, I think economists think it's a six-month predictor. No, uh, uh, no. No. But uh, how, do you, how do you account for the fact that the stock market's doing very well? Uh, so first of all, my, 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 uh, one of my teachers, the, the late Paul Samuelson, famously said that the stock market had predicted nine of the last five recessions. Uh, it's not a very reliable predictor of anything. Uh, but the other thing is the economy is not doing very well, but profits are fine. Um, there, so we, we've actually had a very uneven recovery where profits are, have, have long since recaptured their previous level. 
uh, but wages have not. So since the stock market is a claim on profits. Uh, also, one other thing, um, stock investing in stocks is a, a relative decision, stocks versus bonds. And with, uh, with you know, long-term bond yields, uh, the bond, bond markets are a better guide of what people think is going to happen to the economy. And 10-year uh, uh, bond rates, I didn't check it this morning, but it's been, they've been well under 2% lately, um, and, which mean, and infl inflation adjusted, they've been negative, which is basically people saying, we expect the economy to be flat on its back for a very, very long time, and, and therefore we don't expect the Fed to be raising short-term interest rates for a very, very long time. Given the bond yields being so low, why wouldn't you know, people are probably willing to accept stocks even if the return is lower than before? Because what's the alternative? So I, I don't think there's any great mystery there. Okay, thank you. How are you doing that time, actually? Eight on the dot. OK. Let's, ta let's take two more, because uh, um, I have been go I, I, I don't know what I'm running on right now. So. <laughs> OK, so go ahead. Um, I know that your original um, or work was in international trade and international economics, and just kind of thinking more long term, um, is globalization, international integration, um, is it making us wealthier, uh, you know, more successful, or is it going to be a race to the bottom as workers here compete with um, workers in China and Indonesia, and um, uh, is, is global financial risk being spread out better, or is it essentially just a network to have one minor crash reflect um, through all the economies of the world? Okay, um, and I think the, actually the answer is yes, because um, there's some of all of those things going on. Um, globalization has clearly made, opened up the possibilities for economic growth um, for poorer countries in a way that wasn't wasn't there before. Not all of them, but we have some. So, when I was in grad school. Um, I thought about doing development economics and decided not to because it was too depressing. Because in 1975, there were no success stories. Everybody, you know, development economics was really non-development economics. And, and since then, there have been a number of success stories. Um, South Korea is, you know, was a, was a edge of starvation country, which is now a modern, advanced economy. Not, not, uh, not so different in standard of living from... Uh, from, from much of Europe or, or uh, parts of the United States. Uh, so that's, and that was all achieved through an export-led growth. You have to have open world markets for that to happen. China, for all the problems and so on, China still represents an enormous improvement in, in life for hundreds of millions of people. So, so that's the good sign. It does put some pressure on, on the wages of American workers. Uh, and, uh, and that's grown. Uh, I, I wrote stuff 15 years ago saying the numbers were fairly, were pretty minor. But they're bigger now than they were then, so that's a real issue. Uh, it's not a huge. It's not a race to the bottom for everywhere. Actually, if you look at what's happening right now, um, it's actually working the other way around. Chinese wages are rising fairly rapidly because they even China can run out of labor, and that's what's happening now. So the uh, so the, there is a uh, you know so there, there's there's positive stuff, and the way I would deal with it, given how important it is for the poorest countries to have access to world markets, is not to shut down the globalization, but to um, but have strong say, social safety nets. So you can have country, a country like Sweden that is wide open to international trade, but nonetheless assures everybody of a decent standard of living because it's got a really strong safety net. And, and uh, that, that's, that's what we should be doing. Um, it, global capital markets is yet another story. And um, the record of the, since we really liberalized capital movements, which began in the late 1970s, um, is actually a, one disaster after another. You know, you can tell a theoretical story about why it should be beneficial, should allow capital to flow towards more produ most productive, uh, but the reality is whatever has been going on there has been dominated, swapped by, you know, it's basically my entire uh, career, you know, so one of my things in, in economics has always been, actually, I, I, um, I, I invented uh, currency crises. Uh, not the thing itself, but the, the, the academic literature the, with a paper I wrote in grad school. And business has been good ever since. Um, <laughs> the, and and, and the, so it's a series. The Latin America debt crisis of the 80s, Mexican tequila crisis of 94, uh, Asian crisis of 97, 98, um, the uh, Argentine crisis of, of 2001, 2002, um, all of which brought on by, uh, by bond markets temporarily loving a country, then dumping it. and. Um, and uh, one of the things I will say, actually, is those of us who have who had studied international macroeconomics, international finance, were a lot better prepared 
for this crisis than those who had not. Because if you, your focus was only on the United States, then then runaway financial crises and uh, um, and collapses of balance sheets were something that was a distant memory of the past. If you've been studying international, it was something that was was an ever present reality ever since the 1970s. And so, uh, um, no, the, the uh, that's one of those things that has keeps on people push for it. Um, the wide open movement, particularly of, of short term capital, because. Uh, according to uh, to their notion of what ought to work, it should be a great thing, but in practice, it's turned out to be a, a repeated disaster. Hi, um, I'm Marcelo. I'm graduating senior at Georgetown University, econ major, and um, I wanted to know uh, because I, I follow Scott Sumner's blog. I know they do, yeah. you tussle with him a little bit. Um, well, no, why do you think that uh, pushing for more uh, government spending, which seems to be a lot more difficult, especially considering the Republican opposition? Why do you think that that's an easier path uh, of policy choice as opposed to stocking the Federal Reserve Board with people that would support NGDB targeting and excessive amounts of quantitative easing? And okay, so this is going to be a little while. But the question is, why shouldn't we be leaving the job up to the Fed and just say that the Fed should have a wider mandate? Um, so actually, I'm for both, by the way. I'm for both the, uh, the fiscal policy. But the... Uh, so we talked about this quite a lot. Um, the, there are people, there's a, there's a handful of people, someone like Scott Sumner, who I would regard as, in a lot of ways, the, the heir to Milton Friedman, uh, who believe that the Fed, if only it tried, could do the job. But it turns out that the, what the Fed can do depends a lot not on what it can do now, because it can do some stuff, but mostly on, on convincing people about what it's going to do later, what it's going to do once the economy has recovered. That's really hard to do. I mean, it's, it, it, you should try it. That's why I was yelling at Ben Bernanke about it. You should try it. But to believe that that is a necessarily successful answer, I think, is is, is way too optimistic. Uh, uh, and and you know, people say, well, this, there, there's some evidence of something like that happened in the 1930s, but they were able to make a drastic change in, in expectations by doing what at the time was a very radical thing, which was exiting the gold standard. Give me something equivalent that would be a huge signal now, and and, and maybe I would talk differently. Fiscal policy has huge political obstacles, but it has one great advantage, which is uh, the time to act is when the economy is bad. It doesn't require that you try to convince people that you will do something five years from now. It just requires doing it right now. So maybe Ben Bernanke can get a lot of people hired by promising to have a higher price level five years from now than, than people currently expect. Um, and I, 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 you know, I basically gave him a pretty hard time saying he should be doing that. Um, but if we go and rehire those school teachers, we have rehired those school teachers. It's not, it's not something that relies on convincing the markets about something that's going to happen in the future. It's something that we can do right now. And this week, we had a quite technical discussion of all this. Mike Woodford, who I mentioned before, had a, what I thought was a brilliant paper, laying out the case, lay, first laying out the theoretical case why commitment to future monetary policy might be superior, but why, given the realities, uh, you better, you really want to have some fiscal policy, too. Thank you. Um, I think we're there. Thank you.